Good morning and welcome to the Core Connection. Today's topic is grasping and how, you know, when we have, let's say we have a marvelous, wonderful feeling and the impulse is to say, oh, I want to feel like this forever. It's like that's the first way to be pushing away that feeling that we were so enjoying. So we're going to take a look at that dynamic of, um, of what I'm calling grasping and uh, should be an interesting conversation. But before we get started, let's take a minute or two to get present. Let's take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. And imagine clean, crisp oxygen flooding into your lungs, flowing into your bloodstream, nourishing all your cells, all your organs, bringing vital life energy to your body and your being. And as you exhale, exhale any tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's take another deep breath in through your nose and hold it. This time, imagine brilliant, bright light lighting you up from the inside out, illuminating, electrifying, and energizing all your cells, all your molecules, all your electrons. And creating this beautiful glow from the inside out into the world. And as you exhale, exhale any remaining tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's just gently press our palms together and very, very softly rub your fingers against your palms. Feel the delicious tickling and tingling and send all that wonderful sensation and allow yourselves to become present right here right now in this magnificent physical form that allows you to experience life so welcome 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 grasping yeah so good morning Roslyn so good to have you here with us this morning so and welcome to everybody else who's joining us uh, we're talking about, you, you know, sometimes we get into a space and it's like, oh, this is wonderful. And one of the first things that comes up is I want to feel like this all the time. And um, I want to look like look at the languaging of that, because as soon as we uh, say I want what are we saying we are affirming the lack of something want is lack right not I desire I prefer or isn't this delicious uh, I'm so enjoying it this is my preference this is how I, you know I'm I'm I it's a fulfillment of a desire, whatever, to be basking in it is different than say, I want to feel like this all the time. Because um, as soon as we make that kind of statement, we're taking ourselves out of that experience, right? We're, we're kind of projecting loss into the future. We're kind of projecting that, um, that the end of this thing that we were so enjoying. And, and by doing that, we precipitate that end more quickly, right? Um, so when we're having an amazing experience, to be present in that experience, we get to just enjoy it. What's happening when we say, I wanna feel this way all the time is we're taking ourselves out of that experience to be, um, observing it and recognizing um, that it, it, it's almost it's almost like we're calling in the end of that experience, right? And and I think that this is the case um, not just with saying something like I want to feel this way all the time, but uh, when we're in. Um, in relationship, sometimes, you know, we look at what we want, right? Rather than what we desire, we look at what we want, what's lacking, right? And then when we think about what we want, it's what's wanting, it's what's missing. And um, the, the language that we use is important because it invokes our experience. You know, the language influences our experience. So 
uh, if you are a follower at all of Abraham Hicks and Esther Hicks channels Abraham and um, the law of attraction, the, the language that we use is important. And um, just the language of, um, or, or the experience of grasping, like trying to hold on to this, I'm going to hold on to this feeling. You know, as soon as we allow ourselves or move into that space of holding on, we're, we're kind of um, impeding the flow of life, right? Because we're trying to hold on. And we, I think it's important to recognize the value of contrast, you know, we wouldn't want to be uh, living in rainbows and unicorns all the time without a dark cloud in the sky ever, because then we would stop noticing that we're surrounded by and cherishing the fact that we're surrounded by rainbows and unicorns, right? That would become mundane and um, we wouldn't be able to be present to it in the same way. So I'm wondering uh, what other arenas do we grasp? It's like, oh, we have such an amazing connection with somebody and, and then we want more of that. We want more of that versus we desire more of that or you know, we wanna grab onto it, we wanna hold on to it. And um, as I'm thinking in terms of relationships, I remember the, the saying, if you love something, set it free. And if it's really meant to be, it'll come back to you. Um, so that's really a, uh, an admonition to not be holding on, right? To be allowing for the flow of life. And um, the thing about holding on is that it takes us out of, or grasping is it takes us out of the experience of the present, right? Because in the present, when we are able to presence ourselves, uh, then, then life flows. We're not holding on to anything. We're allowing, allowing things to just ebb and flow as life brings them in and out of our experience. And uh, there's so many paradoxes about um, this holding on, letting go kind of thing, right? Um, I know that it's interesting when we talk about a concept, you say, I'm not grasping that. And I, I think we get to look at, rather than grasping, integrating, what's the difference? When we move into an experience of integration, then whatever that thing is that we were trying to grasp becomes a part of us. And we don't have to hold on to it because it's foundational. So Rosalind says, today's topic reminds me of the expression grasping at straws or get a grip. Perhaps the opposite would be holding something close to your heart, feeling rather than the thinking. You nailed it, Rosalind. Exactly. It's really about the experience rather than the, um, the thinking of it that is tinged with lack or fear of loss, right? Why um, grasping at straws, that's an interesting one. When we, when we think about that, it's like find, trying to grab onto something that's insubstantial, right? Why do we try to grasp onto things? Why do we try to get a grip? What does that mean? It means that we're trying to exert some kind of control is at least that that's my imagining of it is that we're trying to exert some kind of control. And um, why are we trying to exert some kind of control? Because it gives us a sense of safety, 
right? That's what, that's what control is all about. So as soon as we say something like, uh, I want to feel this way forever, or, you know, I, I, um, I want to hold on to that thought, the implication right in that very statement is that it's going to escape or it's going to get away or I'm going to lose it. So there's a fear that underlies that, that whole dynamic, right? So um, I think, I think it's important to be looking at our our language and our also our inclination to feel that something is going to get lost you know just because experiences come and go doesn't mean that it's lost or that their next thing is less than right um as we experience life when we're when the being in the flow is the opposite of trying to hold on right um i'm in this place i'm going to try and hold on to this why because i'm fearful maybe of what might come next um or i'm i'm assuming in some way that what's next is not going to be as wonderful or um, maybe it's even just a fear or anxiety around the unknown, you know, so I'm going to hold on to this um, because I, I don't know what's coming next. And the thing about grasping also or holding on is, is kind of living in a place of lack of abundance it's it's living in a place of lack right because it's or scarcity right because we're figuring oh i have to hold on to this because who knows what's next and we get to look at this in regard to money too you know um the the dynamics around money are very interesting. We started talking about money a couple of weeks ago. I think it's a topic worth talking more about because um, one of the things that drives so many of our behaviors around money is fear, right? Fear of lack, fear of uh, loss, scarcity mentality, all of those things drive our are holding on to, to money, thinking there's some security there. We don't know what the future is gonna bring and money is gonna help us navigate that, that future, right? So we wanna hold on to money. Well, and I said, want to, right? Good morning, good morning, Robin. So good to have you here with us. Uh, we're talking about grasping and, um, uh, holding on and how when we do that we are we are kind of affirming our our fear or our lack now so I often talk about holding with open hand and I think that that's a whole different experience I'm not like especially when we're talking about money uh, it's a very different dynamic to be saying I have to hold on to my money versus I can I can be present. Okay, well, thanks for stopping in. Robin says I, I'll need to rewatch this one. Oh, did, well, maybe for the the uh, the whole idea here, but I'm guessing it's because you don't have time to be with us now. So I'm glad you stopped in. Anyway, um, to hold with open hand is very different from grasping, right? Like if we can hold something with an open hand, there's a trust to allow that to be here. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to stop it from moving or uh, I'm not afraid of its leaving. And I think that the the money conversation is probably a really good one to be looking at this holding and grasping 
kind of idea, but we also have it, we have it with relationships, we have it with um, all kinds of things, with our ideas even, right? So what we get to look at is, you know, I had the reason I'm talking about this is because I, in a couple sessions yesterday, things came up for people and they're like, oh, I'm gonna, I want to hold on to that feeling. And it generated a conversation about, well, what's, you know, what's up with that? Like on some level, that that kind of conversation is an indicator of a lack of trust for self in the universe. It's kind of being in a place of, I, I can't rely on the universe to um, provide this kind of experience again. So I'm gonna hold on to it. I'm gonna hold tight. And, um, when we do that, again, as I said earlier, it separates us from the experience itself. And um, which is a shame because it's accomplishing exactly what we would be trying to avoid, right? We're trying to avoid the disappearance of this feeling. And then as soon as we say, I'm going to, I want to hold on to this what happens is we've separated ourselves from that feeling already, right? In order to be able to say, okay, I've got to hold on to this. So the, the experience itself is now not fully what it was. So um, it's kind of interesting, again, the paradox, it's like, if you love it, set it free kind of thing, um, that in order to have it, we get to let it go, like to be not holding it, to just experience it and not to try to grab it, grasp it, constrain it, restrict it, um, control it. And so Roslyn says, or saying, you would never understand. Oh boy, the choice of words do have an impact on both the receiver and the person holding that thought. A hundred percent. So something like uh, you would never understand. That's an almost an invocation, right? So the, it's interesting though because it can be perceived that that wording. First of all, if I say you would never understand, it's it's saying that I don't believe that you're capable of understanding, and then I might not be able to receive your understanding if that's what my belief is right and you could be reacting to that by thinking that the person is saying that you're not enough or not capable uh, you might get offended or you might rise to the challenge and say of course I can let let's let's give it a try you know like I'm going to rise to the challenge but uh, our words are really, really important. And Robin says, what about security versus holding on? Maybe another conversation. I don't think it's another conversation. I think it's very much this. Thank you, Robin. I think it is this conversation because when we talk about security, what is security? You know, oftentimes the way that we measure security is by what we have, right? Like I'll feel secure when I have a million dollars in the bank, right? Um, for example, like what is security? Security is driven by fear, typically. You know, like depending on how we hold it, usually most people hold security with very tight fists um, and, and have a lot of anxiety and fear around it because what's driving any kind of, impulse for security is a feeling of insecurity, right? So um, we create these constructs that enable us to, to manipulate our minds in such a way that we can then feel secure. But the thing is, if we are innately feeling, not innately, but if we are feeling insecure, no amount of money is gonna make us feel secure. 
you know, we might feel more, um, there might be less panic about money, but, but there are people that have tons and tons of money that are totally insecure, you know, like you would look at their bank statement and you say, oh my gosh, you, you know, you've got it all. You've got to feel secure. And it's like, no. So when we attach our security or our sense of security to externalities, ultimately there is no security in that because money can disappear, you know, money can get devalued, money could get stolen, money could get burned, money could, you know, like there, there are things, there are circumstances, right, where we provide the illusion of control, right? So I'm stashing money in the bank because that's gonna make me feel more secure. Well, first I get to feel secure. And then I get to put the money in the bank and the money may come and go and I get to still be secure. So, um, you know, I, like my dad, my dad had all kinds of money in the market and then the market tanked and he lost half of what he had and it put it, he was in retirement and it put him in a very uh, much different financial situation. You know, but he had he had had the security of having had having made the investments that he did. You know, he was being smart with his money. He was he was invested in in things that were supposed to be solid. And then there was a crash. So, you know, if our individual security is attached to these externalities, then there's a problem. Right. Um, and again, it's kind of like holding with open hand versus grasping. Because if if my whole life, my my experience of my whole uh, security is dependent upon externalities, then if something happens to those externalities, then my well-being, my foundational well-being is then threatened. Right. And um, I'm just looking for Maggie. She's, I hear her biting on things. I think I have this um, wall hanging that has all kinds of beads on it. Maggie likes to pick off the beads. And uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, there are, I, I'm not saying that, you know, the, the financial security, like that's, an important thing in many ways because the way that we live, our ability to have a home and a roof over our heads and food um, is dependent on, on finances. And there's nothing that is certain. And so to know, to have the security in oneself, to know that we're resilient enough to navigate circumstances. That's, that's kind of the security. What, what comes from that security is being able to go with the flow of things, to be able to be present and responsive. Robin says, money is not my issue, a place to call home, being able to know you have a place to lay your head for rest. Okay, so that's a really big thing too, right? So maybe um, I have a great sense of security because I, my, I have a house. Maybe I own a house and that makes me feel secure. Well, there are situations where storms, right? Maybe the house gets leveled by a storm or maybe it gets conscripted by uh, the government to let a um, pipeline go through. You know, like if, if my security is attached to the, the structure of my house, then that could, that could be problematic if something happens to the house, right? And I'm not saying that it's more comfortable or less comfortable, but to have your well-being attached to externalities 
whatever they are, um, is, is something that makes us even more vulnerable to, um, to being devastated, right? Like all my things are gone. And so my life is over. My life is ruined. Well, on, you know, I, I understand, I guess what we're talking about ultimately is non-attachment, you know, to, to be making provisions and then also to be having a place of non-attachment, of presence. So I have, we all have some treasured possessions, right? And so I, I've had um, like some glassware that were, tre you know, treasured possessions. I enjoyed them. I really liked them. They were my favorite, my favorite glasses, for example, drinking glasses, um, crystal or whatever. And uh, lately, it's been really interesting over the past several months, a whole bunch of them got broken. And not just not. Good morning, Lisa. Welcome, welcome. So good to have you here. I don't uh, and I, I don't believe I've seen your name here before. It's great to have you. Um, so I just they ended up getting broken like these these things that i had had and treasured for a long period of time and i i felt like it was a test in the past i probably would have wept over the loss of these things and what i recognize now and i'm very grateful to recognize is that i was able to you know, I got a twinge, I have to admit, I got a twinge, it's like, oh, but it wasn't a horrible, horrible crisis. We're glad to have you back, Lisa. Um, so I think that as we become more solid and secure in ourselves, um, we don't need the external things to, to validate us. And um, we can be grasping less and, and holding with open hand more and um, allowing life to unfold with more, with more grace and have an experience of grace in our lives more often. So um, that's it for for today, I think. So I'm Nira Rubin. This is the Core Connection, and I go live here on the Enlightened World Network Facebook page each weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. And I am so grateful to you guys, all of you, for showing up and sharing and contributing to the conversation. Robin says the challenges we have to the challenges we have to continue on our journey. Thank you for unfolding different ways to look at the situations. Well spoken. Thank you so much, Robin. Much appreciated. And, and I appreciate all of you. And thank you, Rosalind. Um, it's so good to spend this time with you and, uh, and ponder these things, these morning musings together. So um, until next time, so much love and um, hold with open hand, see how that feels. So much love. <laughs>